once millions of buffalo roaming the prairies from Texas to the Canadian Rockies. But by the early 1900s, this lonely, frightened buffalo bull was believed to be the last on the plains of North Dakota. The curious looked on while he stood alone, a lonesome, pitiful curiosity awaiting his fate, not long in coming. But more than a century later, because of a group of dedicated ranchers and conservationists who wanted to save the once mighty North American bison, the buffalo is one of the world's great Renaissance stories. And more than 400,000 again roam the plains. And the American bison is recognized worldwide as the iconic symbol of the American West. If you spend any time around the animal, you fall in love with them. They're incredible um, survivors. What a great story of surviving as a species. It appeals to people. I mean, even Europeans love the American West and the bison is, is a part of that history. The buffalo is America's largest land mammal. It's also been designated as the official national mammal of the United States. A full-grown bull can stand six feet tall from hoof to shoulder, weigh more than 2,000 pounds, and yet jump six feet high and amazingly reach speeds of 40 miles an hour while on a dead run. The buffalo was a key part of the continental ecology. They graze the plains in massive herds, in many places changing the landscape and distributing new grasses and plants as they roamed. They moved continuously, eating, grazing. It was an animal perfectly suited to the summer heat and blinding winter blizzards. When you look at the animal, I think it, it conjures up all of the things that we've heard about the history and you know, how these animals were, were once so numerous that they couldn't count them, and then we got down to literally about 700 being left alive. In the early 1800s, fur trader, explorer, Alexander Henry observed one of the great herds migrating in present-day North Dakota. He awoke one morning at his fur trade post and discovered a herd completely surrounding the small stockade. I dressed and climbed my oak for a better view. I had seen incredible buffalo in the fall, but nothing in comparison to what I now beheld. The ground was covered at every point of the compass for as far as the eye could reach, and every animal was in motion. Alexander Henry, Northwest Fur Trade Company, January 14th. 1801. The herd continued passing Henry's small outpost for three days. As American expansion moved westward, the buffalo were used as food and clothing and were slaughtered by the thousands. Native Americans held the buffalo sacred and celebrated the animal that provided their food and shelter. It was also a part of their religious ceremonies. The rare white buffalo was considered a sign from the Great Spirit. The buffalo still holds a spiritual place in the rituals of many tribes. Bison are sacred. Tkatanka is the Lakota word for bison. As to why it's sacred, um, all that breathes uh, possesses spirit and bison were the most numerous and most powerful animal on the Great Plains. Uh, and bison were providing for the majority of the needs of the people. And so there's this respect that was developed for the bison, not just because it provided them food, but also the spirit of the bison because it was helping us from beyond. <laughs> In the early 1800s, the well-dressed gentlemen of Europe wore felt hats made of beaver pelts. But in 1832, the felt hat 
went out of style, and the silk hat became the rage. The change meant the price of beaver pelts dropped, and the buffalo hide became the main trade good of the vast plains, and the great hunt was on. The move west by railroads encouraged the slaughter. Thousands were shot from trains for sport. Most were simply left to rot. The uh, railroad companies would advertise that people could get on board the train and shoot buffalo as they came across the plains. And of course they were armed. The, the, the passengers may have been armed themselves, but the railroads provided firearms. The trains would slow down to the pace of the buffaloes to make the shots easier for everybody. And they just littered the plains with the carcasses of those buffalo. The buffalo was also used as a political weapon. Kill the buffalo and the tribes who depended on Tatanka would be forced to move further west when their primary source of food vanished. The slaughter of the buffalo is the ugly side of the Western American settlement. The idea was that the buffalo was really the staff of life for the people, and if you took away their food source, it would force them to do the will of the government, so to speak. In the 1860s, frontier legend William Cody killed more than 4,000 buffalo in just 18 months to provide meat for railroad workers. He later became world famous with his traveling Buffalo Bill Wild West show. The massive hunts were having an impact and the buffalo were fast disappearing. Ranching and farming claimed additional prairie habitat. During the winter of 1872-73, more than 1.5 million buffalo hides were shipped east. The tongues were considered a delicacy and the hides were used for coats, tanned and used for industrial belts, boots and other leather goods. The bones gathered from the plains were used as fertilizer. In addition to massive hunts, the disease from domestic livestock herds also had a dramatic impact on the free-ranging bison herds. Native American tribes also noted a decrease in buffalo populations as European migration to the plains began long before market hunting started. The Plains tribes were now on reservations, and most of the buffalo were gone. The last big hunt on the Northern Plains took place along the Grand River of North and South Dakota in 1882 and 1883, and the Sioux from Standing Rock were allowed to hunt the sacred giants one last time. Hundreds of hunters took to the prairie between present-day Lemon, South Dakota and Hedinger, North Dakota. Thousands of buffalo were killed. In 1883, a scrawny young hunter got off the train in Medora, North Dakota. Theodore Roosevelt, had come to hunt buffalo. It took him weeks, but he finally shot and killed a lonely buffalo bull that today hangs at the Roosevelt home in Sagamore Hill, New York. Later, the future president became an ardent conservationist and a leader in efforts to save the American buffalo. Teddy Roosevelt, you know, he, using the bully pulpit, using that incredible ego that he had and, and that commitment that he had to, to the outdoors and to conservation, he really provided the basis and the support to, to bring that back and, you know, provided the, the, the support and the policies to the, to the public lands, to the parks, the national parks, to, to be used as a tool to house those reservoirs of the bison that they were going to reintroduce. By 1890, the number of buffalo left on the plains was estimated at just a thousand, and most were in private herds. There were also some small protected groups in wildlife refuges in Oklahoma. 
Yellowstone National Park and in Canada. Less than 100 of those remaining lived in the wild. The estimates are that the bison population in the U.S. got down to between 500 and 1,000 animals. And it was a handful of mostly ranchers. They, they didn't, I don't think they considered themselves visionaries as much as they did uh, early entrepreneurs that basically kept the buffalo or the bison from going extinct. In 1913, the buffalo nickel made its appearance. The resurgence of the American bison slowly began using seed stock from Yellowstone, a few small remaining private herds, and even the Bronx Zoo. Indian tribes were again encouraged to raise buffalo, and slowly the herds grew. From just hundreds at the turn of the century, the American bison population has grown to more than 400,000 today across North America. Most are part of ranching operations on private lands. Other herds are scattered on federal and state lands and parks and on Indian reservations in the United States and Canada. The herds are expanding as the taste for bison meat grows. It's easier to the degree that they take care of themselves to some degree, but it's harder because they're still a semi-wild animal. They take longer to grow. They don't gain as much. So the cost of raising a buffalo is actually higher than it is to raise beef. Compared to the beef industry, bison ranching is a small business, and promoters say it will likely stay that way. We processed about 50,000 head of bison last year under USDA inspection. Beef does about 120,000 in a single day. So we are just a small, minute part of the meat sector, and we're fine with that. Again, we can maintain quality. 60 Indian tribes across the country are raising the mighty buffalo in an effort to preserve their heritage. Over the years, a lot of our youth has lost um, their identity as natives and bringing back the buffalo using that pasture as a, a classroom and showing the importance to the students how important this animal was to the ancestors. The herds are rounded up and culled once a year. The meat is processed, leather and other byproducts are developed and sold. Entrepreneur and conservationist Ted Turner has thousands of buffalo scattered on several ranches nationwide. Turner has also started opening upscale restaurants across the United States that feature buffalo as his menu centerpiece. Bison meat may taste like great beef, but it is significantly lower in fat and cholesterol, yet high in protein. You know, bison meat is, is we feel, the best protein out there because we haven't tinkered with this animal to create more fat than, than nature was intended to put onto it. I mean, it's illegal to use growth hormones in, in producing bison. As the industry grew, so did the National Buffalo Foundation's collection of artifacts. A Buffalo Hall of Fame began to honor those who started the fight to save the great American bison. Among the inductees, famed artist George Catlin, who predicted the loss of bison in the early 1800s. Texas rancher Charles Goodnight, who began a herd in 1878 and was instrumental in restoring public herds, and famed New York zoologist William T. Hornaday. Modern era Buffalo Hall of Fame inductees include Fred Matthews, the father of the famed Custer State Park herd in South Dakota. Armando Flo Flochini Sr., one of the founders of the National Buffalo Association and a patriarch of one of the modern herds, and entrepreneur and rancher, Ted Turner. In 1992, the artifact collection reached a point that it needed a permanent home, and the National Buffalo Museum was established in Jamestown, North Dakota, a city that builds itself as America's Buffalo City. 
Since then, the museum has been telling the story of the American bison, preserving the heritage. The American Buffalo, an icon of the American West with a history and heritage that is being preserved and growing. This is their story in your American heritage. Woo-hoo! <laughs>